Well, my family came to Long Beach in 1910 uh, from Pennsylvania, where they had been working in coal mines. Something happened that enabled them to move above ground. And they came east or west. Um, the earliest uh, people who came here, um, great aunts and uncles and, and grandfathers, uh, uh, were one of the first uh, waves of, of people to move into this area. My grandfather, Roy Diebel, was a developer. Um, he sold insurance, did real estate development. Uh, he was also an inventor, <clears throat> which is kind of, uh, kind of interesting. Um, he invented an airplane engine um, and a collapsible fishing net. In addition to building a what at the time was the tallest building on the West Coast at the corner of Long Beach Boulevard and Broadway. Uh, he also was, the his company, Diebel Chapman, developed Bixby Knolls, um, selling lots and, and uh, basically he took bean fields and developed them, putting in the streets and the sewers and the, all the infrastructure, um, trained the salespeople to sell the, the lots and, and so on. So. Um, the family's been around a long time, and, and uh, it, it, part of it, hearing about all the stories uh, of what Long Beach was like back in the day really intrigued me uh, to want to see what it was like myself. And that's one of the things that led me to write my book. I wanted to use that as an opportunity for me to put myself at the pike when the pike was cool. Because when I was growing up, the pike was not cool. So. Yeah, that's kind of where the family came in. Um, uncles and aunts all sold real estate, were involved in insurance and all kinds of businesses. I, as a kid, I couldn't go anywhere in town without somebody saying, which Diebel are you? <laughs> they, they all knew somebody in my family. So if I had been a bad kid, which I wasn't, um, I couldn't have gotten away with anything. It kind of snuck in. I didn't even realize I was in love with it. Um, sixth grade. I had a teacher who uh, convinced the school to buy Super 8 film and videotape, uh, and he brought his own Super 8 camera and, at the time, video tape recorder, which was a Sony black and white that used, like, two-inch wide videotape. Um, so my, that first film I ever made was actually on video with dialogue. Uh, kind of crazy. But that's when I started writing. I wanted to make films, and I realized that part of making films was writing the scripts first, and so I became an avid script writer. Uh, I wrote a number of scripts for short films that I made. Uh, by ninth grade, I wrote a 90-page screenplay that was basically a feature film with dialogue. Uh, college, you know, I took film production classes. I also studied journalism, which I think was really important for me because that's pictures and words and putting them together, and it's somewhat of a different way, but it kind of all feeds into the same thing, um, communication, communicating ideas with words and, and images. Uh, so then I kind of shifted gears in college. I went to uh, UC Irvine where they didn't really have a production program. What they had was a, a program that they were inventing on film theory and criticism, which was basically studying film as literature. So we would read uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth and talk about the literary symbolism. And then we would see Akira Kurosawa's The Throne of Blood and talk about how Kurosawa used the symbolic language of film to communicate those same themes and ideas. So um, all the while was writing. So, you know, journalism, writing for the newspapers, and um, actually got hired by the college to write press releases, which I got in the LA Times. That was kind of crazy. Um, so writing just I, and, and to be honest with you, I took it for granted until I was much older. Um, but it's my bread and butter. It's what I do. So one of the first books that I ever read that was a mystery story was The Red-Headed League by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Doyle was the man who gave us Sherlock Holmes, the most beloved character in all of literature in, the Western, in Western civilization anyway. Um, I read that in an Alfred Hitchcock anthology of short stories, and there was something about it. It, it was just such an odd idea. Uh, the Red-Headed League tells the story of, of a, a man who happens to have red hair, who has applied for a job which he is led to believe is available only to men who have red hair through this organization called the Red-Headed League, which turns out to be a complete fake 
it's a front for a, a group of bank robbers who are trying to rob a bank and they need to get this guy out of the picture so they can dig their tunnel. And so they come up with this idea for this, this uh, uh, league that sponsors men with red hair. And the job was, what was it, uh, writing, copying pages from the encyclopedia. It just, you know, crazy. But, but what was behind it was really serious. And what it introduced me to was the idea of the mystery story, um, seeing things and then being able to extrapolate from them some other story that isn't immediately apparent to other people. Holmes, an ama he's an amazing character, absolutely amazing. And it's no um, surprise to me that the, the bank, uh, what is it, the Bank of London, which the Royal Mail Service designated as the address closest to 221B Baker Street, that they received bags of mail for Sherlock Holmes because people believed in him. You know, he's a, he was a character in literature, but people treated him like he was a real person. So that was the beginning. And that led me to, <clears throat> for, I, I ended up reading all of the Holmes stories <clears throat> and the four novels uh, in junior high school. And then I started reading Raymond Chandler. And I think Raymond Chandler has kind of become my, my go-to guy. There's something about his writing that is just absolutely amazing. Um, I've read a lot of different mystery writers. Uh, Hammett, I enjoy Hammett's writing as well. Um, Chandler's my guy, you know? So I kind of got into that. I've read all of the work of other writers like Tony Hillerman and P.D. James and um, Dick Francis, but it's, it's the, the Chandler's and the Hammett's, James M. Cain. Um, those are the guys that I really get inspired by. Well, I, you know, I'm a film guy, so uh, filmmakers inspire me. Um, particularly those filmmakers who, um, if you'll forgive the term auteur, the, 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 the directors who are heavily involved in the writing of their screenplays that they make. Um, the, the two that are right at the top of the list are Stanley Kubrick and Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, both of those guys work with their writers to create the screenplays from which their films were made. And it's, uh, I think it's, it's important. Um, I think it makes the, the film stronger. Um, and it's not that they told the writers what to do. It was that they, they wanted the writers to make sure they understood, this is what I'm going for. So what do you got? So yeah, Hitchcock, Kubrick, um, and there were many other filmmakers. You know, John Sayles, uh, he writes his own screenplays, um, I, th I believe, at least in collaboration with other writers. <clears throat> so that's another area that I've drawn a lot of interest from. And frankly, every medium in some way inspires me. Um, I love music. And that's one of the things I do when I write, is I listen to uh, like Baroque uh, chamber music because there are no lyrics. It's not as obtrusive, say, as a symphony. Um, sometimes I'll listen to jazz, depending on, you know, my mood. Um, again, no lyrics. I don't want um, words to interfere with the creative process. So um, instrumental music to, to, to a degree, and then also um, art, visual art. Uh, I'm, I'm crazy about visual art. I, I've made different kinds of art myself, and um, it's very inspiring to me when I look at a piece. I, I, I saw Kandinsky at the Arm & Hammer once, and I don't know which piece it was. There was other stuff at the museum that day that blew me away, but there's this thing that happened to me in front of that painting one day. I just looked at it, and some, I felt something. And so, so I get inspired in all kinds of ways. Nature also inspires me a lot. One of the things that I like to do <clears throat> is I, li I like to share my background and I like to share my experiences. Um, I like to encourage other people who are trying to do what I'm doing. And I mean, I'm trying to do it. I'm, I'm by no means any kind of best-selling author. Uh, but I've done it, you know, and I can help people who haven't done it try and figure it out. So I do, um, <clears throat> I do stuff with the Historical Society because they've been so helpful to me. Uh, you know, I spent so much time there doing research on this book, um, they moved three times. Uh, but it was important to me that I, I spend time there. <clears throat> They're the people who have all the old archives of the newspapers. And you know they, they were able to give me an advertisement from my grandfather's company, Bixby Knowles. Um, $1,395 lots, right? 1935, that was in the press telegram. Anyway, so then, and then you have um, this organization called Made, Made by Millworks is a, a store downtown that does uh, 
Uh, they do a variety of different things. They have an art gallery and um, uh, they, they have live music, uh, but they also do a series of storytelling events. Um, and I got involved in that when I was invited to talk about writing my book. Uh, but what happened was I really got involved in it on a higher level <clears throat> and began curating the events. So when I did the piece about writing my book, I brought in a guy who published small, uh, he was a small poetry press to talk about that. Um, Nancy Linney Wu to talk about the Long Beach Literary Arts Center, which I'm very involved with. Uh, and then um, we wrapped it up with Lily De Lamora, who's a songwriter, singer-songwriter, and had her talk about her songwriting process. So it became an event that was not just uh, people telling stories, but the stories all had to do with a common theme of creative expression through writing uh, and publishing. So then the next one we did was on food and community. And to me, this is almost even more to the point. Um, I saw this divisiveness that we're surrounded by, and I was looking at what, you know, what can we do that will bring us together? And one of the things that brings people together like nothing else is food. So I looked at this from different perspectives and thought, how can I paint the whole picture? The whole picture became having a urban farmer talk about growing organic food within the city in an urban farm environment, a chef who prepared meals for hundreds of people, organic, locally sourced, uh, a woman who operated a, uh, basically it's a coffee house, but they sell food there, um, and now she has more than one uh, portfolio. This is Kirsten Kamsteiner, and what she did in uh, on the 4th Street corridor was just amazing. Her coffee house transformed that neighborhood. Uh, and then we snuck in for dessert the executive director of Food Finders, who is, uh, that Food Finders is an organization that tries to close the loop on food to keep it from being wasted. So uh, food that is near term in grocery stores, food that restaurants are gonna have to throw away at the end of the day, instead of throwing them in the trash, Food Finders picks them up and takes them around to the shelters and hospices in town. And I actually did that for them uh, through the farmer's market for a while. Um, so that's what we did. Um, so it's not just telling stories now, it's telling a bigger story by bringing people together. So I mean, I suppose you could even think of it like as a magazine. We just did our third um, the other night, which was about brewing. There's an explosion of craft breweries happening in Long Beach. Um, and so what we wanted to do was have people who are building out these breweries and starting this uh, talk about what made them want to do that. You know, uh, it's kind of a big commitment. Um, and, you know, so we brought in, uh, I brought in a co-curator to help me with that because he knew all the brewers. And I had interest in brewing from a historical perspective, from a technological perspective. Uh, he knew the brewers and was able to bring to us a couple of guys who were building out their breweries here at 10 Mile and um, Liberation. Uh, we had uh, a guy from Phantom Carriage who's opening a place downtown called the Fourth Horseman. And then we had, a, this is a total coincidence, filmmaker. I stumbled across a crew that was shooting the opening at Liberation Brewing and discovered they were making a documentary about brewing. So I invited them to come and show a rough cut of their film. So that, in this case, then we had a multimedia storytelling event. Uh, and we got kind of meta <laughs> because now we're showing the film that's showing the guys who are telling the story and we're showing their stories from a different perspective. So it was pretty cool, I have to say. Persistence of Vision began through my passion for the history of Long Beach. Uh, and wanting to see what Long Beach was like back in, say, well, in this case, 1929. I didn't know exactly when I wanted it to take place. Uh, I began doing research with no idea what the story would be, but knowing part of it would take place in Long Beach. Uh, so I did basically a year at the library with the microfilm, microfiche, going through the Los Angeles Times every day uh, for a period of years to try and identify when I wanted it to take place. And I, I came to the conclusion that I wanted it to happen in 1929, but far enough ahead of the crash so that the, the crash is in it, in that the idea of noir is that there's a dark force, right? And for me, the dark force in my book became this thing that's not really in the book, the crash, which is drawing the characters towards it like a black hole in the event horizon. Um, they aren't aware it's out there. 
but it kind of attenuated the, the color of the book in that no matter how happy things got, they always had to be kind of attenuated to this idea that in a couple of months, the bottom's going to fall out. So, and again, none of that's in the book. That was all kind of helping me in my head as I wrote it. Uh, so, and the other part of it that was really inspiring to me was my love of old Hollywood. So thinking about the time period, part of that had to do with what was going on in the world of motion pictures and motion picture production at the time, which, you know, I studied that in school and I had a pretty good knowledge uh, of the history of motion pictures, uh, particularly in Hollywood. So I started pulling out ideas of having it have to do with Hollywood in some respect. Part of that came back to my family uh, from an old photograph of my um, uncle, Joe. <clears throat> Joe Diebel was a, uh, he sold insurance professionally, but he also was an inventor. And he was a performer. He was a member of the Magic Castle. And he did close-up magic. Close-up magic being that kind of magic that you do with simple objects like playing cards or coins where you perform it in front of a person. There's no distance. They're right there. So Joe and his friend, a guy named Harry Buffum, who was of the Buffum's department stores family, uh, were in Avalon on Catalina one day, and they were performing to kind of get a little money. And Stan Laurel saw them performing, and he loved them. He loved them so much, he invited them to come out to his yacht. And we have this picture of my Uncle Joe and Harry Buffum standing with uh, Stan Laurel on his yacht. And the thing of it that really struck me, I think, is that Stan Laurel is wearing a yachting outfit like you've never seen him wear. Uh, you know, the cap and the, the blazer, and I think he's wearing a turtleneck, kind of ribbed, corded, kind of like weave. And he just doesn't look like the guy that we see in the movies with the bowler. And Now, which is funny because one of the things I learned in working on this book was that Laurel was the brains behind the duo. And he was the writer and the director. And when they finished shooting for a day, um, Oliver Hardy would go to Riviera Country Club and try and get in uh, 36 holes. <laughs> and Stan Laurel would go back to the office. And he divided his time between writing their next project and editing the one that they were currently shooting. So his day really never ended until late at night. Um, I, I had a passion for, like, Lon Chaney. I loved, you know, seeing the old films of Lon Chaney. And I just, it, there was, part of it was conscious, part of it was unconscious. I did not put them in the story just to put in famous people. Because there's a connection between something about their upbringing, something about their family lives uh, that ties together with my main character and the kind of craziness that he experienced growing up. So there's a resonance. Um, so those two areas, the history of Long Beach and the, and the idea of the film business, um, those were really part of where I, I came from with this. Knowing I wanted to write a detective story, uh, all I really knew was it's going to be a private detective in Long Beach. That's my main character, private detective in Long Beach. So uh, one weekend, um, you know, after my year of research, I'm realizing, all right, well, I'm going to have to kind of get down to writing this book. Uh, my friends invited me to go out to Palm, Palm Desert for the weekend. I changed it to Palm Springs because historically it would have been, you know, Palm Springs in 29. But we went out to this house that was owned by my friend's father. And he was a successful businessman who had been in, um, he worked for a company called Red Ken, which made hair care products that was acquired by Revlon. And he made a bunch of money and a seat on the board of directors from this transaction. Okay, so we go out to this beautiful house in this exclusive community for the Memorial Day weekend. And I began writing Saturday morning next to the pool. And by the end of the morning, <clears throat> I had completed the first chapter of the book. And my main character, the private detective from Long Beach, was dead. And I, I was like, okay, great. What have I done? What do I do now? And I, I thought, well, okay. Tomorrow, come back out here by the pool, sit down, and start writing chapter two, which I did. Now, funny thing is that what ended up happening was the house where we were, not the actual house, but the idea of that house and that neighborhood, it's in the book, it opens at that house. 
uh, only I, I describe it differently and, and made it the product of the French designer uh, uh, Le Corbusier. Um, so the idea of the, the, the millionaire uh, you know, owning the house who, who was trying to get a seat on the board of directors of, of uh, MGM uh, came from my friend's dad and, and that whole thing. I was just pulling stuff out of the air as I was writing and it, and it just started. And so we left that weekend and I had three chapters written and I continued writing for the next year and completed the first draft. Um, and I have to say, it was as much a surprise to me how it went as it w will be to anybody that reads it. I did not know where it was going. Uh, I, I didn't do an outline. I, the characters came out of my head. Um, and I just, it was, it was almost as though I was reading a book and not writing it. So I was entertained. I was extremely entertained. After my uh, ill-fated first chapter, when the character I thought was my main character died, um, the second chapter I sat down and started writing the second day, uh, this character came driving in out of nowhere, had no idea who he was, Daniel Moretti. I don't know where the name came from. I really don't. It just came into my head while I was writing. And I described him driving in in his DeSoto, so I, I just had this sense right away of, of, you know, who he was, what kind of car he had. I cut out a lot of that stuff because I learned, you know, start in the middle of a scene. Uh, and so we did, uh, I always say we, I cut the whole lead in, which was almost like a film, was like the establishing shot of a film with him driving to this house. I thought, well, you know, okay, let's have him there already. So uh, Moretti is a guy who, um, he, he has quite a backstory, and that's been one of the challenges for me, is not just doing the historical research on 1929 and what was happening, but um, Moretti and a number of other characters in the book were veterans of World War I. So I had to learn about World War I. I had to do a lot of research on what battles were fought. Um, you know, the United States uh, had a unique role in the, film, in, the, in the war in that we sort of replaced Russia when Russia stepped out um, because the war had broken their back economically and led to the revolution because the people were uh, frustrated with having no resources. Um, they, they revolted and the, the czar and the family were killed and Russia became the Soviet Union. So the United States sent the American Expeditionary Force to, uh, to Europe, and it, it was essential that that happen uh, in order for the Allies to win. Uh, I don't know what would have happened if, if that hadn't happened. So, <clears throat> so he has the World War I background, but he also has a layer of background in that he emigrated to the United States when he was a very young child. Uh, he was the son of a man who was basically a criminal who ran a criminal enterprise in New York City and who uh, used his son as a messenger, as a watch, uh, a lookout. Um, uh, Daniel Moretti did not go to school. He didn't have benefit of an education. He learned how to read in the army, in the AEF, because a sergeant befriended him and taught him using the, the, Marine, uh, the manual, the operations manual. Here's, here's how you read. So, uh, uh, and now at this point in his life, he relishes the fact that he can read. Um, but he's still, you know, he's not, he's not a, like a Philip Marlowe college educated guy. He, he doesn't have that level of intelligence. He has a different kind of intelligence. Uh, he has his gut and his gut really is how he operates. Um, so Moretti basically grew up in New York City, criminal father, um, some bad things happened to him. Um, one of the things that happened to him was his father hit him, uh, threw him up against a wall, and he hit his head. And from that day forward, he was unable to see motion pictures. Now, I made this up, I thought. I'd never heard about this, but I, I thought, well, you know, this kind of makes sense. The whole idea of how we see movies is this weird way that your brain works with your optic nerve and, and uh, the, the frames being projected one at a time 24 per second, that uh, the taking the still images and your, your brain kind of blurring them together in movement 
uh, this is how we see movies. Well, Moretti, because of the head injury, is unable to see that. So he basically looks at a screen and you just see a pulsing kind of strobing light. But it was odd because after I wrote the book, I was talking to somebody about it and explaining to him, you know, about this. And he said, oh, yeah, my uncle had that. I said, what? What? <laughs> he said, my uncle had that. I said, how did he get it? He hit his head. Okay. <laughs> I guess I didn't really make that up. But So that that's part of the idea. So that's Persistence of Vision, and that's where the title of the book comes from. Um, and his inability to see movies p- comes into play because the, the crime scene at the beginning of the book, they find a reel of motion picture film h- hidden in the icebox. And so his first key piece of evidence to investigate the murder of this private detective, he's unable to see. And I thought that was kind of interesting at first. And then later realized, you know, that kind of uh, is how it is with a lot of forensic evidence where, you, you know, like with blood, uh, you can't look at blood and say, oh, that's type A, or that's a, he's a secretor. You know, these are different factors that uh, they're able to use to categorize blood. Um, but you need a specialist to do that for you. And in an odd way, Moretti ends up using, uh, well, for example, Charlie Chaplin as a specialist because Chaplin has a projector. And so he goes to Chaplin and asks him, can you look at this film and tell me what's on it? So they sit there and Chaplin describes to him what he's seeing, which is funny because as I wrote it, uh, actually as I rewrote it, I started writing it more and more like Chaplin is becoming the director of the film that he's describing. And some of that is a little dicey, which, uh, which uh, uh, it's just, it, it's, it was funny to me to, to see how that turned out. Um, when you're researching a project like this, the, uh, it's critical that you you go in depth and uh, my friend Rick um, Rick Cluffel he uh, had a, a website called the Agony Column which was about books and he interviewed uh, Guillermo del Toro the filmmaker and author and and del Toro had a really funny thing uh, he commented about the internet people who who do their research exclusively on the internet that that is not sufficient um, there's a lot of stuff out there um, it's not curated. Uh, you need to make sure you can, uh, like, like my, my rule of thumb is uh, I got from the guys who did all the President's Men, two sources of attribution. You know, you want to make sure what you're saying is, is true, is based on fact. Uh, because there's a lot of stuff that's not true. It's like, you know, the whole idea, you can't believe everything you read in the newspaper. Well, apply that to the Internet and that's, multiply it by 10. <laughs> Uh, so I, I did a couple of things. First, I, I, you know, obviously I went to the library. I did uh, research with the microfilm and the microfiche to get the general sense of what was 1929 like. Now, mind you, one of the things that came out of it, this is fascinating to me, um, and anybody that's doing research on a historical period, I recommend don't overlook the advertising because there is stuff to be found in the advertisements that will tell you things about that period, about people, about how they see themselves, about how they see each other, that you won't necessarily get by reading articles. Um, I found something doing the research through the LA Times uh, that ended up becoming a key part of the book. And it was in an advertisement that when I, when I read it, I thought, wait, that, that was a thing? And I thought about it. I thought, of course it was. We don't ever think about it today because we take it for granted. But at that time, this was a thing. And I'm putting this in my book. And I put it in the book. And it's significant. And all because I just stumbled across this advertisement. Um, other, aver- uh, other research I did, Historical Society, I looked through old photographs. They had archives filled with old photographs. A number of people have written books about Long Beach, and so uh, they were able to fill in some of the gaps in the history that I didn't know. You know, my family came in 1910, but Long Beach had existed before that. Uh, what what had changed? Um, there was a club that's in the book, uh, the Pacific Coast Club. My family were members of it. I never got to go. It was closed when I was growing up, uh, although a couple of friends of mine talked the real estate people into uh, letting them see it by <laughs> convincing them that they were going to potentially buy it, which was ridiculous. I can't believe anybody would have looked at these two high school kids and thought, oh, yeah, <laughs> they've, they've got millions of dollars to buy this building. Um, and unfortunately, it was torn down. So there will never be anything 
that I get to see. Um, so I have to kind of make it up too. Uh, but that was part of what I got out of the research was I got to see it. I got to learn more about it. Um, things that I had never been told by my family. Uh, so Pacific Coast Club, the Pike, the Pike is huge. As I mentioned before, um, the Pike was a place back then that was known as the uh, uh, Coney Island of the West. It was so big and so uh, popular among Southern Californians. Um, that was where they went. And of course, back then we had the red, the red car, which dropped them off right there. You know, the car would, would arc down off of Long Beach Boulevard, turn around and head back out Pacific. Um, so, so that's the, the research was critical. Um, and I didn't stop doing the research just because I was writing the book. There were things that would come up as I was writing, and I would, I would think, oh, okay, you know what, I need to know more about that. And in some cases, it was, it was stuff like basic things, like how did a car start? Different cars started different ways. So I need to understand how cars started then as opposed to now. Um, and there were all kinds of things, like the icebox, you know? There were no refrigerators. This was early days of the refrigerator, and they still called them ice boxes, but it was now a, a something that was cooled by electricity and not ice. Um, so there was, it was just endless, really. I mean, I was researching stuff right up until the end. Things having to do with how, uh, well, like, you know, here's, the, here's one I, I picked up. Um, there's a funeral for a Medal of Honor winner in the book. And I was thinking, 21 gun salute. Well, it turns out 21 gun salutes are not um, uh, for no one other than the President of the United States. That I never realized it, but the number of rounds that they fire changes depending on who it is that they're honoring. So that was, that was something that was interesting. Um, yeah, so I, the research was key and it never stopped. So a part of writing this book was learning how to write a novel. I'd never written a novel, so this was, this was my learning. And as, as such, I did a lot of experimentation in terms of trying things. Uh, I made mistakes and had to correct them in some cases. Uh, but one of the experiments that I did was, um, I, I mentioned earlier about the backstory of the main character growing up in New York. I, at one point, wrote four chapters that left the, the plot line of the main story of my book, and it, it went to his childhood. So four chapters then were interposed into the book, which had detail about his childhood. It had detail about the immigration process through Ellis Island, uh, which I learned from going there. Um, it had detail about his father's criminal activities and uh, things that happened to his mother. You know, his mother went through a horrible experience um, in a fire, <clears throat> again, based on real stuff. So by taking those chapters and putting them into the, into the book so that it would, it would all of a sudden go from at the time, 1929, contemporary, to 1904, 08, you know, uh, what, I, what I realized was I really liked what I had found in terms of the, the material that I developed in those chapters, but I didn't like what those chapters did disrupting the flow of the book. And so after having written them and put them in, I went back and took them out. But they never really came out all the way. What I put in those chapters actually ended up enhancing what was in the book just by virtue of the fact that I had spent the time to develop that familiar, familiarity with uh, uh, those ideas and the, that research and, and uh, the behaviors and all that. It ended up really helping the rest of the book, even though I took it out. It's still there. It is critical to have an editor. Uh, and, you know, um, editing involves, you know, on one level writing and punctuation and grammar and, and that stuff, but on another level it means v validating information. Um, I happen to have a friend who I've known since high school. Uh, we, were, we were on yearbook staff together and uh, ended up going to UC Irvine together. Lisa has been working as a librarian at the library at UC Irvine since we graduated, uh, which, me, oh, and her major was grammar and rhetoric, okay? So, 
she had a background academically of exactly what I needed somebody to do just on the nuts and bolts of, you know, did this sentence break? <laughs> is, this ac is this correct? Uh, am I misspeaking? Uh, and, am I mangling the language? But beyond that, uh, she, was, she had access to databases that the average person doesn't have access to. Let's put it that way. One day, I, uh, I had seen when I was doing my research at the library something which is related to the persistence of vision and something that's in the book, uh, a picture of uh, the front page. It was the front page of the LA Times in 1929 in which Leland Stanford was announcing the uh, 50th anniversary of the invention of the motion picture and claiming credit for the invention of the motion picture. Uh, he had uh, made a bet back in the day uh, with a guy who, um, that the bet was that at some point all four horses hooves leave the ground while a horse is running. Well, the way he won that bet was by hiring a photographer to come and photograph a horse running. And what he did was he set up a dozen cameras with trip wires. And that horse ran in front of those cameras. And every time it tripped a wire, the camera took a, a picture. So there were 12 photographs taken in succession, and they were able to see then all of the hooves leaving the ground at one time, and he won his bet. But then he claimed that was the first motion picture, which predated Edison and his research and development by decades. Well, I thought that was hysterical. So as I had gone back and forth on the idea of calling the book Persistence of Vision and including this odd thing about the main character not being able to see movies, I finally committed I'm going all in. It's called Persistence of Vision. I need to find this article. And so I went to Lisa, uh, emailed her, like, hey, do you think you might be able to find this? And it was in my inbox in five minutes, the picture of the front page of the LA Times with that article. And it's in the book. So Lisa was able to um, help me on multiple levels. And not just that, she was also really great in terms of encouragement. Um, the fact that she loved this book really helped a lot. Um, I remember the night she, she got to the end of the first um, act, <laughs> and I got a text from her exclaiming her surprise at what happens. And I thought, okay, that worked. <laughs> so invaluable, invaluable assistance. It's funny, I had been writing screenplays, uh, and when I started working this, Working on this book, I had I had not actively written a screenplay in a while, but I thought at one point about writing this as a screenplay. Uh, having written a number of screenplays and and had this experience where I, uh, you talk about the different hats that you wear. Um, I'm a I'm a writer, producer, director. I've I've done several short films. Uh, I've helped produce two feature films. Um, I understand how to make movies to a degree, and and uh, when I write a script, uh, up, up until recently, <laughs> recently, a few years ago, I would always end up looking at the script I was writing, and if I cared about it, and I mean I'm writing it, why that, that kind of means I care about it, I start thinking in the back of my mind, what would it be like to direct this? So the director's hat comes on, and I start thinking about directorially, how could I do this? Well, then I go from, so the writer's hat, director's hat, producer's hat comes on. The producer's hat says, how can I do this cheaply? <laughs> well, right there, producer's hat undermines the writing of the project because now all of a sudden you, you're hobbling yourself. How can I do this cheaply? I'm still writing the script. Well, I can make it cheaply if I write a cheap script. So that starts to affect and impact the development of what I'm doing. What I realized with this was I... I could totally love seeing somebody recreate the pike using the latest and greatest special effects. So, you know, you get the roller coaster, the Ferris wheel, and there's Catalina out there on the ocean and this pier and just all that stuff. So, so when I realized that I was going to hobble what I was writing, I just said, I can't do that. I'm going to write this as a novel, even though I've never written a novel. And when it's done, if somebody should want to adapt it into a screenplay, great. 
and maybe that would be me, but somebody else has to decide to make this film because I don't want that to affect this. I want to have this be pure and, and write it without any kind of interference from those parts of my brain that um, are going to try and get me to change it for economic reasons. I want this to just be whatever it's going to be. So that's why I did it that way. Okay, I want the readers to have fun. I want people who read this book to have a good time. I want them to feel like they're on a ride, to be curious about what happened and maybe thinking about who done it, although that's not really important. Uh, I, I, I want them to, uh, I'd, I would like them to appreciate the time and the, and the work that I put into doing it. Uh, that's really, that's really it. Um, I, this is not a great work of literature. Maybe one of these days I'll write something that is, but this was my first novel. That's all. This is how I learned how to write a novel. I, that's it. We've moved into this era of self-publishing where uh, a writer can uh, write a book, get some cover art, upload it, and do print on demand, and they're a published novelist. Uh, there's a good side and a bad side to that. Um, you know, anybody can do it. So it's a double-edged sword. Uh, in my case, I, I did it myself without a publisher because I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a publisher. And it was like, here's a way I can get the book out. Um, I did a lot of research into doing that. And I, I discovered that, you know, agents these days and publishing companies, they're looking at authors to take on more and more of the responsibility of promoting their books. And as a, as a part of that, um, I thought, well, okay, if that's what they're looking for, if I publish this book myself and promote it, that demonstrates that to them. A, my willingness to do it. B, my ability to do it. I am learning as I go every day. It is, and I'll tell you something, it's not easy. I don't recommend this to the faint of heart. Um, you know, uh, Every day I learn something new, um, using social media to promote. Um, you know, there's the, do I advertise? Do I buy, uh, buy ad space on Facebook? Do I, well, what do I do? Do I pay for a review in Kirkus? You know, I'm learning that you do that. People pay for reviews. That blew my mind. Uh, it's, it's just, it's all about selling this thing. And really, in a way, for me, I've gotten a lot out of this process personally because you're investing in yourself, um, which, you know, I, I feel pretty good about the fact that I've written this novel. And when I look at, which I have been doing lately, looking at the amount of money that I spent to do it and to promote it and to try and get it out there. I mean, this is not a money-making proposition yet by any means. Uh, it's it's hard. It is really hard. And then doing the events. Um, I do author events at libraries, different places, you know, uh, bookstores. Uh, I do writing workshops now, uh, which has been very interesting. Um, it's just another tool. The, the storytelling events, the, 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 the whole thing started, pardon me, the whole thing started with me selling the book and doing the storytelling events to sell the book. So, so much of my life has become about <laughs> promoting the book. Uh, you have to really think about this. If this is something you're interested in, you really have to know going in, I'm, I'm willing to do the work uh, because there's a lot of work. The sequel, to, uh, the, the sequel to Persistence of Vision, which hasn't, it has no title yet, um, it came about while I was writing the first draft of Persistence of Vision. I, I was, I was um, ride sharing with the guy I worked with, and he picked me up every day, and that's when I wrote. Was right before I go get in the car with him. So every morning I would get in the car, and he would hear what I'd been up to. So one morning I got in his car. I went to get in the car, and there was a document on the seat. Uh, passenger seat, and I said, what's this? And he said, that's, that's the subject of your next book. Okay. So I, I start looking at this document, and what it is, it was a magazine article that told the story of the bonus march, which I had never heard. And as I read, I became incensed. Uh, the story, and this is, this is not a story, this is not fiction, this actually happened. Uh, in 
World War II, World War I, soldiers who volunteered were given a bonus, and the bonus was a contra contractual um, stipulation that said at some point in the future, and I said they, they had determined what that point was, but it was like 1933, that the men who fought for the AEF would be given a bonus. Well, what happened in 29 in the fall with the crash created a, a, a need on the part of many of the veterans to get some kind of an assist from the government. And so they appealed to the federal government and the Congress to pay their bonus early or part of it. Congress voted no. And the veterans marched on Washington, D.C. They marched, they built a tent city on the perimeter, they occupied it, and that tent city was nicknamed Hooverville, uh, which didn't sit well with the president, as every subsequent tent city was named Hooverville as a result. Uh, Hoover decided he didn't like what was going on, and he decided to uh, use his powers as the president. He commanded the military, led by Douglas MacArthur, to rout these veterans and their families. Remember, these aren't just the soldiers that fought in World War I. These are their wives and children as well. And so MacArthur went in with tanks and horses, infantry. Um, they burned the tent city, burned possessions of these soldiers. And, and when I read this, I was so stunned that this had happened in our country. And then I thought, well, you know, today it kind of feels like that's not that surprising. So I'm going to use this as the backstory for my next book. Now, I, again, didn't know how. I mean, at that point, I really didn't, you know, barely knew what I was doing. But I, I sort of had that going in background while I was writing Persistence of Vision. The difference here is going to be that the new book will take place on the East Coast. Uh, Moretti is going to revisit his family for the first time in years. He hasn't seen them since he was a child, so he's going to go meet his adult sister and adult brother and their families. His mother's still alive. He's going to meet his mother again for the first time in a long time. His father's dead, which, you know, is part of the story behind Persistence of Vision. So, uh, you know, he, he doesn't have that. But he's reconnecting with his uh, roots in this. Um, and that's in New York. Then they go down to Washington, D.C. to for him to participate in the bonus march. And things happen. Not just involved with the bonus march, but with his family, because now he's married and has a child. So I'm bringing characters from the first book into the second book. I'm introducing some new ones. Uh, he's going to be rubbing elbows with people from the world of surreal and Dada art, as opposed to Hollywood. Um, and I really can't tell you more than that at this point, because I don't know myself. I never intended on writing a series when I started. Uh, it, really, that second book, the suggestion from my colleague when he presented me with that magazine article, um, I could have just read it and thought about it and put it in a drawer. But I realized the same way that I wrote the first book, that you know, I don't need to know what happens. If I write this the same way, which I'm doing, I've gotten five chapters written so far, I just start and it goes, and things come out. And in some cases, they surprise me. And I have to tell you, that's really fun. When what you're writing surprises you, I guess it also makes you feel like you're a little maybe schizophrenic. <laughs> it's like someone else is writing it, <laughs> but it's fun. Um, but also, beyond being fun, in this case, I think this is dealing with a really serious subject. The first book doesn't really have that and so the second book is going to be distinguished because of that backstory. The third book, which I already have in, in mind, uh, I say third book in that it's the third one that I have, you know, in my head. I don't know. There may be others. Uh, but I'm not trying to make this a series. And I don't want to make it be something if it's not. Um, the second book, though, has already demonstrated to me the same quality of the writing process as the first book. 
sitting down saying, okay, start. I'm not sure where it ended up. What do I do? Just keep writing. Keep writing. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go somewhere. You may not know where, but it's going to go somewhere. And as long as it's fun and interesting, I'm going to go there. This is what I tell them. Um, if you want to be a writer, write. Two kinds of people in the world. People who want to write and people who write. Uh, the last workshop I did on screenwriting, I had a guy in the class who he clearly had experience that would lend itself to some writing project. I don't know what. But he'd been through some stuff, and he kept talking to me about why he couldn't, why he couldn't. And I just finally told him, I said, look, do you want to write? Or do you, are you a writer? Because what I'm hearing from you is you want to write. I said, anybody can want to write. You need to sit down and overcome whatever it is that's keeping you from doing it. Uh, for, and I mean, it's not an easy thing for some people. Sitting quietly by yourself is not something, I mean, we're social, right? But I could write in a sports bar with 20 big screen TVs playing 20 football games and people screaming and yelling because I don't care about sports. I can sit there with that as background noise, and I can write. Um, so, but, and that kind of solves the problem of sol uh, uh, being solitary, right? It's not me sitting in a room by myself writing. I've written on airplanes and airports, and bars, you know, restaurants, bus benches, wh whatever. Just everywhere I could possibly write, I find a way to write. Uh, and it's... it's I, I think partly because I have a dual personality in that I have um, a desire to be with people part of the time and a desire to be by myself part of the time. And that's kind of important. If you're not somebody who's willing to spend time with yourself, and writing is not for you. <laughs> it really isn't because it means not just spending time by yourself, but spending time with yourself because you need to think. You need to, you need to look in your mind and, and, you know, I mean... I look at what I've been through in my life, and that's the fuel for what I do for creative projects, whether it be a multimedia art piece or a film or a book. If I may, I want to thank my parents. You know, um, they encouraged me. Um, they told me I'm the writer in the family, although I'm not necessarily sure I believe that. I've read a couple of things my brother's written lately, and he's he's got some skills too. My father actually, I found a bunch of stuff my father had written. I didn't know he had been journaling, and I was astonished by his ability to describe things. You know, he was a math guy. My dad was a programmer, computer programmer for McDonnell Douglas. Um, my parents, they believed in me, and they provided me with opportunities to explore myself creative, uh, creatively. Um, so, you know, that, that, I would not be where I am if it wasn't, uh, it wasn't for them. Throwback Thursdays, a sketchbook, began with a piece I wrote for a, an NPR program called Dime Stories. Dime Stories was a monthly event that took place uh, at locations across the country where uh, at live readings, uh, people would read stories that had to be three minutes or less. They were recorded, then uploaded. Uh, people went through them and decided which ones would be the ones that they would broadcast that week. So. I did this story at a reading for Dime Stories. Uh, it was the first time I'd done one that was really brief. You know, I, I, uh, I had taken a story that I'd written before and I cut it down so, for length to, to fit that. And it, I mean, the story's great anyway, and it really kind of lent itself to this kind of a thing. Uh, got a good reaction from people. Uh, sometime later, uh, with the phenomenon of, uh, was it the hashtag Throwback Thursday, I began posting on Facebook on Thursdays stories that I wrote that are biographical, uh, uh, autobiographical, um, told in the present tense. Uh, and the reason I did that was initially uh, when I tried to post that story, that Dime Stories story, uh, it was longer than 2,000 characters. And with Facebook, Facebook looks at 2,000 characters as the limit for a post. If your piece is longer than 2,000 characters, 
Facebook converts it into a note. And very simply what happens is with a note, it opens that in a separate window, browser window. And what I found immediately was people weren't going there. So I thought, all right, well, if they want to stay in their timeline in Facebook, I need to keep it under 2,000 characters. 2,000 characters, not words. That's pretty short. It's a page. It's basically like a page. So I wrote a piece about, uh, and, and I you know, shamelessly picked the most famous name I knew. Uh, I had an encounter with Steven Spielberg. So I wrote this piece about encountering Steven Spielberg and him telling me the name of his next film, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and then not telling me anything about what it's about, telling me that was a secret, and how I ended up accidentally finding out what that meant. Uh, so 2,000 characters, once a week, I'd publish these stories, and, and that was kind of how it started. Uh, what came out of it was the idea that I had some themes that were sort of manifesting themselves. A lot of it has to do with my family, with my parents. A lot of it had to do with cars and my experience in cars. Uh, I was taught to drive very early for reasons which I won't go into now, but it turned out there was a reason. And part of what the Throwback Thursdays pieces are really about is creating a, a multi-perspective uh, picture of my life growing up. Uh, what I came to realize was uh, there's a guy, uh, Juno Diaz, he's a writer, um, and he, he does these books that are compilations of stories, but the stories all add up to a, a whole. So I thought, you know, I really like the way he does that. Each chapter is a story in itself. But when you look at them all taken together, there's a bigger story. Well, okay, that's what I'm doing. So I started looking at what the patterns were, realizing there were patterns. I was also getting encouraged from people who were reading them. Uh, people who read them really liked them and said, you should put these in a book. So I thought, okay, well, I've already got them out there. I, you know, I just need to keep going till I have enough material. I'm not sure what how much, what enough material is at this point, because I continue to come up with ideas. But there have been certain things that have kind of come out of that that are significant. And so the byproduct of this is a book that I am developing using those pieces of Throwback Thursdays to create these short stories that would then be chapters in the book that all contribute to creating this overall story. Um, so they're sketches. That's really what they are. That's why I called it a sketchbook. Because these pieces that are 2,000 characters, they're almost just to remind me of the memory of the, of the event so that I can go back to it and then redraw it, rewrite it, and try and bring more into it. Um, one of the pieces was actually published in uh, a literary journal, Lemmix number no. 6. Uh, that's a piece called on the run in the getaway car, which is about my brother and sister and I and an experience that we had in a car, which was really unusual. Um, and that's kind of how these stories come to be. You know, for whatever reason, something sort of surfaces and I think, okay, that's, that's interesting. I'm, I'm gonna use that one because that tells part of this story that I don't even know what I'm telling yet. But I know it when I see it. <laughs> so what inspired me to create this book specifically was an experience that I had at my 10-year high school reunion. Um, prior to uh, my reunion, my mother had been murdered. And while it had been out of the news for a while, right before the reunion, something had happened. Uh, the man who killed her had been arrested for killing someone else in the same manner. And I was getting ready to go to my high school reunion, and that was what was in the newspapers. And I was thinking, oh my god, I'm going to go there. I'm dreading this. People are just going to talk about this all night. Oh, my God. You know, no one said a thing to me. And I was so relieved. And then this guy, Duncan Kennedy, came up to me and he said, you know, when I heard what happened to your mom, and I, I just kind of like tense, like not sure what's going to happen, but knowing something is. And he said, all I could think of was, her in her uniform when she was our den mother in Cub Scouts. 
And I stopped and said, what? She was our den mother? And all of a sudden, this picture of her in my friend's garage in her blue and gold uniform just popped into my head. And I thought, oh, my God, I forgot that she was our den mother in Cub Scouts. The, the, the loss of her was profound. What happened was horrible, horrible. I can't even begin to explain how it was horrible. But w what happens is your, your mind's trying to protect you from it. And from, so, so what I think was happening was it, it was beginning to suppress the negative experiences. But it's not discreet. It actually ends up suppressing other experiences as well. Some that, I don't want to lose that. I don't want to lose the memory of my mom as a Cub Scout den mother. So I, I thought, I need to start writing these down. And so I did. And in some cases, that early on, those were just uh, a different set of sketches. But in some cases, I would just write a sentence in a file for future reference. That I want to develop something based on this idea. Develop something based on this. Develop something based on this. And so I kind of started doing this a couple of decades ago, before, um, excuse me, before Persistence of Vision even started because I wanted to make sure I didn't forget. And the more I wrote, the more I remembered. And just kept going and going and going. You know, one of the things I think is important about, about writing and, and telling stories is for people to realize that they're not alone. That things that happen to one person may also happen to someone else. And that, that, it, that can contribute to a culture of compassion. Um, it makes a huge difference when you know you're not alone in an experience, you know. Um, and I'm going to say there have been times when I made the, uh, I, I, I assumed that I knew what someone was feeling because I had lost my mom. And I came to realize how I would feel if someone had told me, oh, I know how you feel. You don't. You don't. But you can still appreciate the loss and share with them um, the grief that they're experiencing. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, if, if to, to, to get, what I'd like the reader to get out of it is that, that if they've had a similar experience, and I mean, this book is just basically all about experiences. What was your relationship like with your mom? You know, I, I, I had a weird relationship with my mom. My mom simultaneously thought I was a genius and told me when I was an adult that she had been scared of me when I was a kid. And I was like, what? <laughs> you were scared of me? And she said, yeah, because you, you talked about so many things that I didn't understand, even at a very young age. Uh, I didn't feel as your mother that I was part of your world. And I thought, well, that's, that's interesting. I wonder if anybody else has had that experience. You know, it's kind of the thing about parenting is, and I'm not a parent, so I can't speak about this from personal experience, but I know a lot of kids I know, I know a lot of people who've had kids, and you know, part of what you're trying to do is make them smarter than you. You want to give them that leg up, you know? And, and it's funny, because what happened was she did, and it was like she was almost scared of what she had done, deliberately. I wanted to be smart, and I, I was. <laughs> but to her, that was scary. It was kind of weird having your mom tell you that, too, I have to say. Really just, you know, trying to find what, what connects us as people, you know? What, what are our similar experiences, shared experiences? Um, emotion, you know? I'm, love and grief. So there's a lot of love and grief in, in Throwback Thursdays. I see them as two sides. I see love and grief as two sides of the same coin.